Hi, I'm Vanessa Richardson. And I'm Carter Roy. Welcome to Historical Figures, formerly known as Remarkable Lives, Tragic Deaths. Every Wednesday, we discuss a different person's lasting historical impact, unique personality, and impression on the world around them. Our audio biographies cover big lives, but we like to focus on little-known facts. Today, we'll be diving into the life of famous merchant traveler Marco Polo. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Historical Figures, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to subscribe because a new episode comes out every Wednesday. You have probably heard the name Marco Polo. Yeah, I heard it this summer at the pool. Marco Polo! (laughs) Yeah, but who is this man? You may have a vague notion, the Italian explorer who went to China. He wrote a popular book about his world travels. But what are the details of his life? And just as importantly, what is true and what isn't? Because that is a big question surrounding him. In fact, when I think about the life of Marco Polo, I'm reminded of the movie The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Ah, Yes, with Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne. Yeah, in the film, Jimmy Stewart takes credit for shooting the notorious criminal Liberty Valance, even though John Wayne was the man who actually did it. And John Wayne lets Jimmy Stewart's character get away with it. Mm -hmm. Later in the film, after Jimmy Stewart has ridden his false belief to fame and great success, he finally comes clean to a reporter. However, the journalist decides not to correct the record. The reporter says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that is Marco Polo. When the legend became fact. Mm -hmm. We will need to examine his life closely in order to separate fact from fiction. The facts start in Italy in the middle of the 13th century, in the Republic of Venice, the coastal northeastern part of the country. Picture Venice today, a city of churches and squares, crowded architecture and canals. It was not much different all those centuries ago. That's where Marco Polo was born in 1254. Some list his birth date as September 15th, while others say it can't be determined. So even his birth remains somewhat of a mystery. In fact, we know almost nothing about Marco Polo's childhood. What we do know is that his father Niccolo, yes, that's right, his father's name was Niccolo Polo, was himself a merchant traveler. But little Marco didn't see his father for the first 15 years of his life. Well, that's because Niccolo was abroad traveling and trading. Some claim that Marco's father didn't know he had a son, that he got Marco's mother pregnant before leaving and didn't find out about it until years later. However, that's probably not true. This was the Middle Ages. Men, especially of Niccolo's station, did as they pleased, and he could very well have left on his journey and delegated the raising of the child to its mother. So Niccolo, learning that for 15 years he'd had a son and didn't know, is most likely an embellishment to make the story more dramatic. But there's always the slim possibility it could be true. Mm, Which is a theme we'll be returning to as we explore the life of Marco Polo, separating fact from fiction. One fact, Marco's mother, Nicole, died when he was young. So Marco was raised by relatives, an aunt and an uncle, instead of Nicole and Niccolo. In the 13th century, the merchant families of Venice were prominent in the city, influential in both business and government, and that stature would have been conveyed on the Polo family. Which means Marco would have had a wealthy upbringing and he would have been highly educated. This probably explains why he was always called a quick study and how, once he started traveling, he was able to pick up new languages so easily. Another trait that people would see in Marco was his ability to charm others. Undoubtedly, he developed this skill when he was young, possibly because he grew up without parents. As a young orphan, he had to learn to adapt and fit in. Although it had to be lonely once his mother was gone and his father was off in some distant foreign land. It's fair to ask if young Marco ever found himself down by the docks, staring out at the sea, wondering if he could hop on a ship and join his dad. Mm, And he did join his dad when Niccolo returned to Venice in 1269, when Marco was 15. What had Niccolo been doing during those first 15 years of Marco's life? Well, it was quite a tale. Niccolo and his brother Maffeo, Marco's uncle, had left Venice to go east, first to Constantinople, which is now Istanbul in modern-day Turkey. 
For centuries, Constantinople was the largest and wealthiest city in Europe. As traders, the Polos set up shop there and stayed for years. When they sensed the political situation was turning, they moved on. It was a wise move. After the Nicaeans recaptured Constantinople in 1261, the new emperor wiped out the Venetian quarter of the city. Captured Venetian citizens were blinded. And this was the era of not only the Crusades, but other religious and political battles as well. Empires fighting for territory and influence. Real Game of Thrones stuff. <laughs> Niccolo and Maffeo set up a new base in Soldaia on the Black Sea. This was part of the newly formed Mongol state of the Golden Horde. But in search of greater profits, they kept moving east, first to the giant encampment known as the city of Sarai, then to Bukhara in what is now Uzbekistan, and finally all the way to Dadu, which is modern-day Beijing, China. So Marco's dad and uncle made it to China before him. But he would get there soon enough. In Dadu, the Polos would meet the leader of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, Kublai Khan. Which is a name that may sound familiar. I remember the poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge about the leader, who Coleridge called Kubla and not Kublai. The poem was written by Coleridge when he was high on opium and had a dream about the Mongolian emperor. But it's hardly historically accurate. The real Kublai Khan came from famous lineage. His grandfather was Genghis Khan. That's right, the Genghis Khan, the infamous Mongol leader who united the nomadic tribes of Northeast Asia launched the Mongol invasions that conquered most of Eurasia, and became notorious for leading his group of warriors on a path of death and destruction. Two generations later, his grandson, Kublai, would eventually establish a base of operations that stretched east to west from the Black Sea to the Pacific Ocean, and north to south from Siberia to Afghanistan. A huge mass of land, and into the court of this emperor and general stepped Niccolo and Maffeo Polo, Kublai offered them a proposition. He would send them back to Italy with his deputy as an ambassador to the Pope, and they would bring back 100 missionaries, along with oil from the lamp of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. He also gave them the Pesa, a golden tablet a foot long and three inches wide that allowed the holder to obtain food, lodging, and horses throughout the Kublai Khan's dominion. Well, a nice thing to have as they embarked on what could be a perilous journey. Mm -hmm. But the trip would not be a short one, or without its complications. The deputy who was supposed to become the ambassador to the Vatican could not stand the rigors of travel and abandon the polos. Then the brothers had to wait after the death of Pope Clement IV in 1268 for the election of a new pontiff. During this interim, while they were waiting for a new pope, Niccolo and Maffeo returned to Venice where Niccolo was reunited with his teenage son, Marco. Hmm, we can only speculate at how father and son got along after 15 years apart, but Niccolo was still focused on his mission for Kublai Khan. Finally, in 1271, after two years and three months of waiting, a new pope was elected, Gregory X. If that seems absurdly long, it is. The election of Pope Gregory X came after the longest papal conclave ever. That's the most time the Roman Catholic Church has ever gone without a pope. Right? Doesn't it usually take about a week? <laughs> well, the average is about 35 days. But the last several popes have been elected in about three. But back to the story. The Polos were in Venice much longer than anticipated, which gave Marco Polo the perfect opportunity to bond with his long-lost father. And while the election of Pope Gregory X may have been great for Marco, it was not so great for Niccolo. Right. Gregory received the polos and was presented with a letter from Kublai Khan. Unfortunately, Pope Gregory did not want to send 100 priests to China. Hmm. How many was he willing to send? 80? 50? 25? Two. Two friars. Oof, that's it? Two friars? Wouldn't Kublai Khan be offended by that? It gets worse. The friars became spooked early in the journey and ran off. But Niccolo and Maffeo persisted on, and they did have a new traveling companion who would stick with them all the way to the court of Kublai Khan, now 17-year-old Marco Polo. That family bonding time paid off. Most believe they traveled along the northern Silk Road, but it is possible they may have taken the southern route. And although we can't be sure of the exact path, one thing we can be sure of is that young Marco had a special affinity for traveling. 
as he later described crossing the Gobi Desert. When a man is riding through this desert by night, and for some reason he gets separated from his companions, he hears spirit voices talking to him. It sounds like a cliché, but the land spoke to him, and he also warned of the dangers, saying, often these voices lure him away from the path, and he never finds it again. It was a long and arduous journey. At one point, Marco wrote that this desert is reported to be so long that it would take a year to go from end to end. And at the narrowest point, it takes a month to cross it. It consists entirely of mountains and sands and valleys. There is nothing at all to eat. In what is now Afghanistan, Marco got sick. And they were forced to stop to rest and recover. Then the journey recommenced. It took four years until 1275 before the Polos reached Kublai Khan, then at his summer home known as Xanadu. Of course, he was expecting 100 priests, which they didn't have. And they didn't even have the two friars. But they presented him with the gifts from the Pope, including a vial of holy water. And they did have young Marco Polo, who was now 21. Kublai Khan took a liking to Marco and accepted Marco, his father and uncle, into his court. It was a fortuitous turn of events, because a foreigner in a strange land was just as likely to end up on the wrong side of a weapon, or tossed into captivity. After obtaining the favor of Kublai Khan, the Polos had unparalleled access to his empire. Although they had only planned to stay for a few years, the Polos would end up being there for over two decades. Marco would learn four languages and travel widely throughout the region. Khan eventually employed Marco as a special envoy and sent him to areas never before explored by Europeans, including Burma, India, and Tibet. Marco was fascinated by India, and later he would write an extensive report about India's Hindu customs. But his first love was China, or as he called it, Katai. As an intimate of the emperor, Marco was appointed to jobs of greater and greater significance in the region. He served as the governor of a Chinese city. He worked as an official of the Privy Council. At one point, he was even the tax inspector at Yanzhou, a city in southwestern China. He always carried a stamped metal packet from Khan himself to establish his credentials and guarantee his safety. If there is one thing that comes through in Marco Polo's later writings, it is his fondness for China. Long passages reveal his fascination with the culture, the people, and its geography. He would document the country's riches in silk and spices, and he would enthusiastically describe its ways and traditions. Still, after years in China, Marco longed to return to his homeland. But it wasn't so easy as just packing up and going home. Kublai Khan had grown fond of the Polos and didn't want them to leave. And when Kublai Khan didn't want you to leave... You didn't leave. The Polos bided their time until an opportunity arose. And eventually, it did. A Mongol princess was going to be married to a prince in Persia. Would Kublai Khan allow the Polos, Niccolo, Maffeo, and Marco, to escort the princess to her wedding in Persia and then return home to Venice? Reluctantly, the leader agreed. In 1292, the Polos left for Persia, which was in modern-day Iran. They departed from the coast of China to travel by sea. But it was a harrowing journey. They ran into storms and battled illness. When the trip began, the passengers and crew numbered several hundred. By the time they reached their destination, the port of Hormuz in Persia, only 18 people had survived. Fortunately, one of them was the princess. And three others were the Polos. The princess was delivered to her Persian fiancé, and the couple were married. Meanwhile, the Polos continued on their way. Well, there was another setback in Turkey, where Genoese officials confiscated three-quarters of the family's wealth. Still, the Polos kept going, until finally, over two years after leaving China, they arrived back in Venice. It was 1295, and after 24 years away from the canals, the Polos were home. But it was not quite the home they remembered. Understandably, after being away for so long, there was going to be an adjustment period. Marco had left as a 17-year-old. He was now almost 41. He had to get used to the language, his old friends and acquaintances, the way of life that was so different from what he was accustomed to. 
he felt more comfortable in the court of Kublai Khan than walking through his hometown. There was also the matter of a war. Mm, as is so often the case. The Republic of Venice was at war with their rival city, Genoa. Rival cities. Yes, like Athens and Sparta in ancient Greece. Or Boston versus New York when the Red Sox played the Yankees. Exactly. Now, Venice and Genoa had been battling for dominance of the Mediterranean Sea starting in the middle of the 13th century. This was the second of what would be four wars between the two republics over 125 years. In 1294, a fleet from Venice was destroyed by a force gathered from Genoa's eastern colonies, and in 1295, war was officially declared. As a proud Venetian and man of honor, Marco Polo joined the fight. He commanded a ship and led his sailors into battle. But this war would favor the other side. And Marco Polo was not the warrior that his friends the Khans were. Marco was captured and thrown in a Genoa prison. It certainly looked bleak. Stuck in a dungeon, trapped, tired, hungry, broken. But in fact, being behind bars turned out to be a fortunate break. Because with him was a fellow inmate named Rustichello. Rustichello from Pisa was a writer. He had written a book about the legend of King Arthur and was the first Italian author to do so. While he was in prison, Marco Polo began dictating his memoirs. And Rusticello dutifully took it down. The collaboration would result in a book that made Marco Polo a famous celebrity. It was called Le Livre des Merveilles du Monde. Which is French for The Book of Wonders of the World. In English, it would come to be called The Description of the World, and then later as The Travels of Marco Polo. In time, Marco Polo's autobiography would become its own publishing phenomenon. Through the years, there have been more than 120 different versions of the book. It's impossible to overstate the importance of this book to the legacy of Marco Polo. Other Europeans had traveled to Asia before him, but his was the first recorded history. We know that history, in its simplest form, results from someone telling the story of what happened. And telling it first can anchor our expectations to what we believe actually happened. That said, there are a few obvious things to point out. First, Marco Polo was dictating. Certainly he had a prodigious memory, but he wasn't relating this in real time. The events he was talking about had happened years before. And some of the events recounted in the book, for example, ones that involved his father or Kublai Khan, didn't even happen to him. So you're already getting a second or third hand account. Second, Rustichello was writing it down. If point one is that the narrator might be unreliable, point two is that the recorder might be unreliable too. And finally, as we noted, the book spread far and wide, spawning many different versions, varying in length and breadth. You can almost think of it as a literary version of the old telephone game. You know, when kids stand in a line and each person repeats a sentence to the person next to them. By the time you get to the end, it often bears no resemblance to what was said at the beginning. So, given all that, we really need to examine the travels of Marco Polo and fess up to its shortcomings. For starters, it certainly contains errors. For example, in describing two of the cities of China, Marco Polo says Hangzhou has 12,000 bridges, and the smaller city of Suzhou had 6,000 bridges of its own. A later count, a more accurate count, found that Hangzhou and its suburbs contained less than 400 bridges, and there were less than 300 in Suzhou. Which leads us right into the next concession, the book contains exaggerations. And nowhere is that more clear than when Marco is giving his account of Kublai Khan. He starts by calling Kublai Khan's palace the greatest that ever was seen, which was arguably true. But then he claims the hall in the palace could hold 6,000 diners, and the wall around the palace was four miles long. Obvious exaggerations. Mm -hmm. It really gets out of hand when Marco starts describing Kublai Khan's hunting party. According to Polo, there were 20,000 dog handlers and 10,000 falconers. Apparently, when Kublai Khan went on a hunt, his hunting party was the size of the crowd at a Green Bay Packers game. <laughs> Not to mention 20,000 dogs and 10,000 birds. Well, clearly, Marco had a thing for large numbers. 
He says that one parade in honor of Kublai Khan included 5,000 elephants and more than 100,000 white horses. I would not want to be one of the people cleaning up after that parade. Mm -mm. (laughs) In fairness to Marco Polo, when a leader as powerful as Kublai Khan went hunting, he would bring a large party. And it was not uncommon for a Mongolian leader to keep a stable of elephants. It's just the scale of the numbers that's out of hand. So I would call that embellishment more than total fabrication. And you have to keep in mind that sometimes Marco was writing in metaphor. For example, when Marco Polo says the inhabitants of an island he called Angaman all have the crown of a head like a dog and teeth and eyes like dogs, he might not be literally saying they had a human body and a dog head. More likely, he just didn't think they were that good looking. Definitely not a flattering or likely accurate description. Mm -hmm. Another exaggeration, when he says that during the journey through the desert in Iran, they were beset by a group of robbers who could, quote, make the whole day become dark, especially when he adds that, I tell you that Master Mark himself was as good as taken by that people in that darkness. Hmm. What do you think he meant by that? (laughs) It's not as clear as his opinion on the Angaman Islanders? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Okay, suppose you were coming through the desert, tired, hungry, bored, and then in the distance there was a rumbling. Maybe not even enough to register through your boredom. And then before you realize what's happening, here comes an ambush down upon you, kicking up a cloud of sand so you can't see. And in a flash, the marauders are grabbing people's belongings and someone from your party gets snatched up and taken away as a slave. It's all so sudden you barely realize what happened. And as you try to think back and piece it together, all that remains is the fear you felt and the nagging thought that deep in your heart, you're just grateful that it wasn't you who got taken. Wow, way to paint a vivid picture. That's exactly what I think Marco was doing, undoubtedly with a little help from Rustichello. Couldn't this tale just be a poetic way of picturing such a scenario? Maybe. That still seems like overly dramatic BS. Right. Well, yeah, but that was very much part of the writing style at the time, particularly for these adventure stories. Remember that Polo's ghostwriter, Rustichello, had written a book about King Arthur. When you're writing about knights on magic quests and people slaying dragons, you're not writing only about facts. True. And it goes right back to how we started this episode. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Mm -hmm. Which leads us to the final piece of the Marco Polo puzzle— And that is what can only be called total fabrications. Mm, For example? Well, Marco Polo describes a palace in Japan as being made of solid gold, contending that even the floors were gold more than two fingers thick. Then he maintains that red pearls were in abundance in the Sea of Japan when they're not native to the area. Mm, Sure, he got that wrong, but... He insists that the men on one island had tails more than a palm in size. Uh, tails more than a palm in size? All right, now that's just flat out made up. Then there's how Marco Polo claims that he and his father and his uncle developed the giant catapults that defeated the Song Dynasty during the siege of the city of Xiangyang, even though the battle happened two years before they arrived in China. Okay, well it could have been Rustichello trying to make them the heroes of the story. There's even a passage where Polo declares that there are unicorns on an island, and these unicorns are at least as big as an elephant. Okay, maybe he got his hand on some of Coleridge's opium before he wrote that. (laughs) Well, in this case, he was just describing rhinoceroses. Oh, (laughs) okay, I see it. Very ugly unicorns. Yeah, there's so many of these outright whoppers in the book that it could shake your faith in Marco Polo's entire story. In 1995, a historian who went back and re-examined the text asked a very provocative question. Did Marco Polo even go to China? Did he even go to China? Really? What was the basis of that theory? Well, she wanted to know, if this was supposed to be a comprehensive travelogue, why didn't Marco Polo ever mention tea or chopsticks or even the Great Wall of China? Oh, well, now that you mention it, why didn't he bring it up? Who knows? Maybe tea didn't seem so fascinating to him. Maybe the Venetians couldn't master chopsticks and ate with their fingers instead of using chopsticks. And as for the Great Wall of China, it wasn't built up to the form that we know it until the Ming Dynasty. That was a century after Marco Polo visited. Ah, I see. Just because he left something out doesn't mean he wasn't there. 
but it seems like there's still some doubt that he actually visited. Mm, not in my mind. Look at all the things he got right. Describing the abundant silks and spices of China, noting how they used black stones that burned better than wood, aka coal, talking about their paper money, giving details about China's trade with India and other parts of Asia. Well, not to mention he brought pasta and ice cream back to Italy. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. That's another myth. Oops, sorry. <laughs> But for the actual travel, the details are fundamentally accurate. He knew that lapis lazuli could be found in the Badakhshan region of Afghanistan. He knew about the nutmeg and aromatic roots of Java. He knew that people in Sri Lanka made a joy juice from the fermented sap of palm trees. And it wasn't like that joy juice was sold anywhere in Europe. But you don't have to take my word for it. About 20 years ago, a writer for National Geographic magazine followed Marco Polo's journeys across Asia from Iraq to China and then back via Sumatra, India and Sri Lanka. It was a 6,000 mile trip and he used Marco Polo's book as his guide. He was convinced of the essential truthfulness of the book because the geographic information is right. And where did Marco Polo get that if he didn't travel that same route? So you're saying the book, while it contains tall tales, is true? I am. Unfortunately, many of Polo's countrymen were not so sure. In Italy, Marco Polo's book was called Il Milione, The Million, because the Italians believed it contains a million tall tales. A million? Their numbers are as far off as Marco Polo's. Uh, yes. <laughs> And ironically, after publishing his book of extraordinary adventures, he would go on to live an ordinary life. Marco Polo was released from prison in 1299, after the conclusion of the Second Venetian Genoese War. His memoir was released the next year. It would be printed in French, Italian and Latin, and became a popular read in Europe. And it would make Marco Polo a celebrity. But the twist is that few readers believe the book to be true. So Marco's notoriety came from people admiring what they considered to be his bold and imaginative lies. Consequently, Marco moved on with his life. In 1300, the same year the book came out, Marco Polo got married, and his father Niccolo passed away. Marco was 46 years old. He and his wife, Donata, had three daughters in quick succession, Fantina, Bellella, and Moretta. There would be no more world travels for the world's most famous world traveler. Although he and his uncle Maffeo were said to finance other expeditions, they never returned to Asia or the Silk Road. Instead, it would be the quiet family life of an Italian merchant. Marco lived in Venice for the next quarter century. He contracted an illness in 1323 and was confined to bed. Reportedly, when Marco Polo was on his deathbed, he received friends and fans who beseeched him to come clean. They said now that his life was coming to an end, it was time for him to confess to his bold exaggerations. But he refused, saying he had not written half of what he had seen. Still, he was popular to have so many people coming to visit him at the end. That's right. But sadly, there would be no recovery. Marco Polo died in January of 1324. His final resting place is in dispute. Which is so Marco Polo. Even in death, there's controversy over the facts. Some say he was buried at the Church of San Lorenzo in Venice, but that his tomb was lost when the church was remodeled. Others say he was actually buried at the Church of San Sebastiano. But either way, he passed on in his beloved Venice, survived by his wife and three daughters, a successful husband and father. Ultimately, what was Marco Polo's legacy? Obviously, he has a place in pop culture. There have been films about his life, a Netflix television series, a video game. He's even in a Geico commercial depicting Marco Polo playing the pool game, Marco Polo. Oh, yes, the pool game. But how did the Italian merchant become the subject of a pool game for children? Like most everything else about Marco Polo, that is another subject where we have to separate fact from fiction. Some people claim that when Marco was traveling with his father, Niccolo, Niccolo would call out Marco and Marco would respond, Polo. However, there's no evidence of that. In fact, that explanation certainly seems like it was made up conveniently to explain the game. The game does date back to the 1700s, but it is just a variation of blind man's bluff. And as for why participants call out Marco and Polo, who knows? 
Maybe it just sounds good.、Hmm. Or maybe it was because he was known as an explorer, and the person who's it is going through unknown water, discovering something new. Oh, well, in that case, the game could very well have been named after the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama. <laughs> Except Marco Polo came centuries before da Gama, so he gets credit for being first. Another piece of Marco Polo's legacy, a more substantial one, is cartography. The making of maps. I'm thinking in particular of the Fra Mauro map of 1453. This was a map of the world as it was understood to be in 1453 by the Italian cartographer Fra Mauro. The Fra Mauro map, which depicts Europe, Asia, and Africa, as well as the Indian and Atlantic oceans, is strikingly accurate. Over 500 years later, when NASA took a photo from space and compared it to the map, they called the result stunning.、Mm. And what does this have to do with Marco Polo? Well, according to reports, Fra Mauro used Polo's book as a source for knowledge, particularly about areas in East Asia. The map was an important milestone in cartography because it marked the end of Bible-based geography and tried to present factual details without regard to political or religious beliefs. So Marco Polo may have contributed to this new way of thinking, or at least played a role in inspiring it, which leads us to the final part of Marco Polo's legacy: inspiration. Well, many who read Marco Polo's book were entertained or amused by it, and then they put it back on the shelf. And some were frustrated by it, but there were others who got excited about the possibility of travel and discovery. And one of those others was Christopher Columbus. That's right. During his voyages, Columbus actually carried with him a copy of Marco Polo's book. And we know Columbus had read the book because there were handwritten notes in the margins. And thus, Marco Polo's legacy inspired other famous explorers, driven by the same insatiable curiosity which once led Marco Polo across continents. And today, though there may be no unknown continents left to discover, astronauts and scientists continue Marco Polo's legacy of discovery by exploring the furthest reaches of space. Just as Marco Polo searched for new countries, we now search for new worlds. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Historical Figures. A new episode comes out every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe to Historical Figures on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast directory. And while you're there, leave us a five-star review. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast, and on Twitter at Parcast Network, or through our website Parcast dot com. That's P A R C A S T dot com. As always, we thank you for listening. Historical Figures was created by Max Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Carrie Murphy and Joel Stein. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Historical Figures is written by Stephen Delello and stars Vanessa Richardson and Carter Roy. 